happened? The bow fell off! How can that happen? One of the questions we get asked the most is not about us, our yacht Florence, or the last four years that we've spent sailing around the world, but about the sailing rowing dinghy that we travel with that splits in half. So in this video, we're going to answer all of those questions about our dinghy. This little dinghy has been over halfway around the world with us now. She's been sailed in several different countries and enabled us to explore jungle rivers, sea caves, major cities, world-class reefs, countless deserted beaches and given us some unforgettable experiences. Our dinghy was built for us by my dad and is possibly the most loved dinghy in the world. We call her the machine after the British band Florence and the Machine and the fact that she's our rowing machine. Even the cat likes the dinghy. Hey cat, do you like the dinghy? Before we set off to sail around the world, we knew we wanted a hard dinghy because we wanted to sail and row as our primary means of getting around and an inflatable dinghy just doesn't cut it. They're far too difficult to row and sail. A yacht tender is effectively a sailor's car. We use it to get ashore, or to get to other boats and to carry things like our groceries whenever we need to. But as we rarely use the engine and we tend to row our sail, maybe our tender's more of a bicycle. The problem with most hard dinghies that row or sail well is that they take up a lot of space on deck, space that we don't have on Florence. So for us, a nesting dinghy was the only way forward. A nesting dinghy is basically a dinghy that splits into two pieces. So our dinghy is basically two boats that bolt together. The bow section turns and fits inside the stern section to nest the two dinghies together and save space. Having a boat that splits in two can have its advantages. I want to go that way. Well, I want to go that way. Well, go then. There are a few different types of nesting dinghy available, from build your own to fully finished versions with a sailing rig. The niche is so small of nesting dinghies that there isn't really a second-hand market and finished dinghies were way out of our price range. Like, way out of our price range. I'm incredibly lucky that my dad has built and rebuilt several wooden boats throughout my life and kindly offered to build us a dinghy for our round-the-world trip. That's my lovely dad there. Unfortunately, instead of inheriting his woodworking skills, I got his ability to blink during photos. There are several designs of sailing nesting dinghies around. We chose the nine foot spindrift by B&B Yacht Designs and ordered the paper plans for around $60 to be delivered from the US. From a set of paper plans, my dad sourced the materials and built the dinghy in the last few months that we were preparing Florence at the opposite end of the country. I don't have many photos of the build because we didn't see her until she was completed, but she's made from six millimeter plywood in the stitch and glue method and then once the main construction is finished, she was sawn in half to create the two separate pieces which now nest together. There is a lot of work involved in building a dinghy and Amy's dad's time frame was pretty tight. We only decided to set off and sail around the world nine months before we left and we only bought Florence six months before we left and that meant it wasn't until then that we knew what size nesting dinghy would fit on board the yacht that we were going to buy. Despite the large challenge that we posed him, Dad delivered the dinghy just days before we set off. It still blows me away that my dad built this dinghy for us. As her launch day was also so close to the time that we were leaving England, it was an exciting but emotional time for us all. It was a pretty windy day when we first launched the dinghy, 
in Amy's dad's face was a picture of pride and concern as we put the sailing rig straight in and went for a buzz around the harbour. One of the things that we love the most about our dinghy is how great she is to row. She rows like a dream with one person. However, she is much harder to row with a passenger as she tends to dig in the stern. We could counter this by both rowing side by side like this. But it's a bit awkward. We normally end up going around in circles when we try this. We could also add another rowing position further forward, but we tend to be carrying something, so just balance it up by loading our groceries or kit in the bow. Rowing keeps us fit, means that we don't have to fill up our petrol cans for the outboard very often, and also if we have to leave the dinghy that's somewhere not so secure, and leaving her with some cheap and easy to replace oars is much better and less of a worry than leaving her there with the outboard. The downside is that it's hard work, especially in the tropics, and it's slow. But with this dinghy, there are some other options. The machine is as per the plans, apart from a couple of small alterations to the sailing rig. The plans call for a wooden or aluminium mast for the dinghy. We've actually got a sporty all carbon rig. We happen to have an old broken racing dinghy mast in the garage and along with a windsurfer carbon mast as a boom, we have this nice all carbon rig which really makes a difference. We also have a mast track up the back of the mast which means we can raise and lower the sail on the water instead of the sleeve fluff that the plans state. We have a Dacron sail with one reefing point which we rarely use and a simple off-boom sheeting system. We both learned to sail in small wooden dinghies like this before moving on to more high performance dinghies later in life. And dinghy sailing has been such a huge part of our lives. We used to spend all of our spare time and money racing small dinghies and it's even how we met. Leaving all that behind was much easier to swallow with the thought of being able to explore the bays and rivers of the countries we visit with the dinghy that we carry on board. We have sailed this dinghy in all but one of the 25 countries we have visited so far. Call us purist hippies, but there's something beautiful about sailing across an ocean and then rigging your dinghy and sailing ashore. No noisy, smelly engine, just the power of the wind transporting you to your new destination. Just like rowing, she actually sails best single-handed, which is what we do for fun. But in actual fact, most of the time we've got both of us in the dinghy, as well as our groceries or anything else that we need to carry piled into the front for the day. Whenever there's two of us on board, I tend to sit in the bow because I fit into this tiny space much better than Matt does. And although I try to make it look comfortable, it's really not. And every time we tack or jive, the van here tries to behead me. But that's a small price to pay for the ability she gives us to explore the beautiful places we visit under sail together. In the four years we've had her, she's only been capsized once, and that was by me being a bit stupid. She's pretty good really most of the time, but when you capsize her, she fills completely up with water to the gunnels, and it took a lot of bailing out, which is why we haven't done it again. Our dinghy is nowhere near as stable as a standard inflatable. Unless you stand right in the centre when you're getting into her, you can easily tip her up. And if you're not used to that, you can find out the hard way.
You've probably seen us getting into the water from the dinghy. But what you might not have noticed is that the other person is always working to balance the boat, whether they're still in it themselves or just holding on to the side from the water. When we need to get into the dinghy alone, we tend to get in or out over the stern. Do you want to pass me a bailer? I need a bigger bucket. As the machine is effectively two separate boats, you need to bail each section out when she fills with water. Sometimes we use this to our advantage when she fills up with rainwater and we use the separate sections to create two laundry tubs. So we do the wash in the bow and the rinse in the stern. So the rowing machine becomes our washing machine. Talking of machines. We do have an engine for the dinghy, but we rarely use it. We tend to use the engine when it's too windy to sail or row, or when there's no wind. We also use it when we have a long way to travel on multiple trips to carry water, food or visitors. Carrying the dinghy with the engine on is obviously much more difficult, which is one of the reasons that we try to row wherever possible. At least 90% of the places we travel to involve carrying the dinghy up a beach, ramp or slipway to get ashore. In places with big tides, this can be a very long carry. This is the payoff for coming in early and going up the sand dunes when it's nice and cool. It means we didn't come in at the right state of tide. So now we've got to carry the dinghy about a half a mile <laughs> down the beach until we can launch her and get back to Florence. With the engine on? With the engine on, because it was too far to row in against the wind. Yeah. Fitting wheels would help this but they can't easily be fitted to our dinghy due to the way that we store her on Florence's deck. The main reason we have a nesting dinghy is we don't have space for a full-size hard dinghy. We store the machine here on the foredeck at Florence. We attach Florence's spinnaker halyard to a bridle on the dinghy to allow us to winch her onto the deck. The deck space we have is not flat, so my dad developed a neat system to work around the step in the deck level and secure the dinghy. The bow fits and bolts into these hardwood blocks. And then we use the rudder gudgeons to attach an A-frame to the stern. Once in place, we strap the dinghy down and forward. You have to secure the dinghy really well up here on the bow, because out at sea, when a wave comes across and hits it, it's amazing the power in those waves. We were originally really worried storing her up here on the bow that she'd get damaged or we'd lose her in a big sea. And there have been so many times that we've been out in rough weather and we've been crouched behind the spray hood. And we've been hit by a big wave and we've peered out expecting to see her gone. And she's still there. She's made it across two oceans and over halfway around the world so far. When we set off, people warned us that having a dinghy up here on the bow would make sail handling really difficult. We've actually found the opposite. We find that she creates a stable platform that we can sit on to launch the spinnaker from. And when we're using the stay sail or the storm jib in heavier weather, we actually lash it down ready on top of the dinghy and it actually makes life easier. We only ever tow the dinghy behind Florence for short distances 
inshore in very flat water and calm conditions. So in summary, some of the things that we love about our dinghy are the fact that she's such a great boat to both row and sail. That she's adaptable to our moods. That we can fit her into half the space of a normal hard dinghy. And that she's a toy as well as a way of getting around. With those advantages come some compromises. We have to put up with life in the slow lane, less stability than an inflatable tender, well that didn't work. <laughs> okay so it turns out she's actually a little bit more stable than we thought. And more time spent on maintenance, but they are compromises we are happy to make. We absolutely love our dinghy, but we'd be interested to know whether or not you would choose a sailing nesting dinghy as your tender. Let us know in the comments. And we hope to see you next time. Next time, our lockdown restrictions are finally eased and we can sail out to explore the local area. We'd like to thank everybody who supports the making of these videos, especially our star patrons. Thanks for watching, we really enjoy reading your comments and if you'd like to join the crew to support these videos you can follow the link to our Patreon site. And don't forget to subscribe to make sure you catch the next one.